In 1978, at Boeing Aircraft in Seattle, engineers were designing experimental aircraft. Exotic things with two wings or two tails or two fuselages, and just weird stuff. Because who knows, it might work. A young computer scientist named Lauren Carpenter was helping them visualize what the planes might look like in flight. I would get the data from them and make pictures uh, from various angles, but I wanted to be able to put a mountain behind them because every B Boeing publicity photo in existence has a mountain behind it. But there was no way to do mountains. Mountains have millions and millions of little triangles and polygons or whatever you want to call it, and uh, we had enough trouble with a hundred, especially in those days when our machines were uh, slower than the ones you have in your watch. Carpenter didn't want to make just any mountains. He wanted to create a landscape the planes could fly through. But there was no way to do that with existing animation techniques. From the time movies began, animators had to draw each frame by hand, thousands of them to make even a short cartoon. That's why they call me Thumper. They call me Thumper. But that was before Lauren Carpenter stumbled across the work of a little-known mathematician named Benoit Mandelbrot. In 1978, I ran into this book in a bookstore. Fractals Form, Chance, and Dimension by Benoit Mandelbrot, and it has to do with the fractal geometry of nature. So I bought the book and took it home and read it, cover to cover, every last little word, including footnotes and references, twice. In his book, Mandelbrot said that many forms in nature can be described mathematically as fractals, a word he invented to define shapes that look jagged and broken. He said that you can create a fractal by taking a smooth-looking shape and breaking it into pieces over and over again. Carpenter decided he'd try doing that on his computer. Within three days, I was producing pictures of mountains on my computer at work. The method is, is dead simple. You start with a landscape made out of very rough triangles, big ones. And then for each triangle, break it into, into four triangles. And then do that again, then again and again and again and again. Endless repetition what mathematicians call iteration. It's one of the keys to fractal geometry. The pictures were stunning. They were just totally stunning. No one has ever seen anything like this. And I just opened a whole new door to the new world of making pictures. And it got the computer uh, graphics community excited about fractals because suddenly they were easy to do. And so people started doing them all over the place. Carpenter soon left Boeing to join Lucasfilm, where instead of making mountains, he created a whole new planet for Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. It was the first ever completely computer-generated sequence in a feature film. Fascinating. Made possible by the new mathematics of fractal geometry. Benoit Mandelbrot, whose work had inspired that innovation, was someone who prided himself on standing outside the mainstream. I can see things that nobody else suspects until I point out to them. Oh, of course, of course, but they haven't seen it before. You can see it in the clouds, in the mountains, even inside the human body. The key to fractal geometry, and the thing that evaded anyone until really Mandelbrot sort of said this is the way to look at things, is that if you look on the surface, you see complexity, and it looks very non-mathematical. What Mandelbrot said was that, think not of what you see, but what it took to produce what you see. It takes endless repetition, and that gives rise to one of the defining characteristics of a fractal what mathematicians call self-similarity. The main idea is always, as you zoom in and zoom out, the objects look the same. If you look at something at this scale, and then you pick a small piece of it and you zoom in, it looks very much the same. The whole of the fractal looks just like a part. 
which looks just like the next smaller part. The similarity of the pattern just keeps on going. One of the most familiar examples of self-similarity is a tree. If we look at each of the nodes, the branching nodes of this tree, what you'll actually see is that the pattern of branching is very similar throughout the tree. As we go from the base of the tree to higher up, you'll see we'll have mother branches, then branching then into daughter branches. If we take this one branch and node and then go up to a higher branch or node, what we'll actually find is again that the pattern of branching is similar. Again, this pattern of branching is repeated throughout the tree all the way ultimately out to the tips where the leaves are. You see self-similarity in everything from a stalk of broccoli to the surface of the moon to the arteries that transport blood through our bodies. But Mandelbrot's fascination with these irregular looking shapes put him squarely at odds with centuries of mathematical tradition. In the whole of science the whole of mathematics, the smoothness was everything. What I did was to open up roughness for investigation. We use mathematics to build the pyramids, to, to construct the Parthenon. Uh, we use mathematics to study the regular motion of the planets and so forth. We became used to the fact that certain patterns were amenable to mathematics, the, the architectural ones, but largely the patterns of human-made structures where we had straight lines and circles and the, and the perfect geometric shapes. The basic assumption that underlies classical mathematics is that everything is extremely regular. I mean, it, it, you reduce everything to straight lines. Circles, triangles. Flat surfaces. Pyramids. Tetrahedron, icosahedron, dodecahedron, smooth edges. Classical mathematics is really only well suited to study the world that we've created, the things we've built using that classical mathematics. The patterns in nature, the things that were already there before we came onto the planet, the trees, the plants, the clouds, the weather systems, those were outside of mathematics. Until the 1970s, when Benoit Mandelbrot introduced his new geometry. Mandelbrot came along and said, hey guys, all you need to do is look at these patterns of nature in the right way, and you can apply mathematics. There is an order beneath the seeming chaos. You can write down formulas that describe clouds and flowers and plants. It's just that they're different kinds of formulas, and they give you a different kind of geometry. The big question is, why did it take till the 1970s before somebody wrote a book called The Fractal Geometry of Nature, if they're all around us? Why didn't we see them before? The answer seems to be, well, people were seeing them before. People clearly recognize this repeating quality in nature. People like the great 19th century Japanese artist, Katsushka Hokusai. If you look well enough, you see a shadow of a cloud over Mount Fuji. The cloud is billows upon billows upon billows. Hokusai with the great wave, you know, on top of the great wave, the smaller waves. After my book mentioned that Hokusai was fractal, I got inundated with people who say, now we understand Hokusai. Hokusai was drawing fractals. Everybody thinks that mathematicians are very different from artists. I've come to realize that art is actually really close to mathematics and that they're just using different language. And so for Mandelbrot, it's not about equations. It's about how do we explain this visual phenomenon. Mandelbrot's fascination with the visual side of math began when he was a student. It is only in January 44, that suddenly I fell in love with mathematics. And not mathematics in general, with the geometry.